my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I'm the, the Senior Vice President uh, from, for the Energy Security and Climate Change Program at CSIS. And I wanna say a big thank you to the ambassador, uh, to Congressman Graves for those introductory comments and for getting us started uh, on, a, on a good foot for our panel discussion today. So as my uh, panelists uh, uh, join us uh, in unmuting their videos or, or turning on their videos, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, just to sort of situate the conversation, I think that some of the remarks that Congressman Graves just offered about um, uh, the the energy transition that has been underway, the the idea that all countries, uh, most countries under the Paris uh, Agreement and otherwise have a shared agreement on the goals, just maybe different ways of getting there. It recognizes, you know, a fundamental truth, which is even before COVID-19 hit, we were in the midst of a very profound energy transition, one that is a transition to lower carbon energy sources, a more digitally connected energy system, decentralized uh, power sources, and very sort of um, a deeper integration of the consumer into the energy system, really big challenges and, and opportunities that countries and companies alike we're having to grapple with. And then we have been hit by this COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, one of the reasons why we can't all be together having this conversation today. It has hit not only sort of our way of life, but our livelihoods. It has um, hit the energy sector in some fairly profound ways, um, both in terms of when, when countries uh, are experiencing a lockdown associated with, with the virus, or just the behavioral changes that we're seeing uh, as people think about their public health as they go about their way of their day-to-day -day way of life, um, or the longer-term economic impacts that we'll see uh, distributed uh, quite unevenly, in fact, across the world in the wake of this crisis. The IEA uh, has also noted that there is anticipated that that COVID-19 will have a, a fairly profound impact on even the investment environment for the energy sector, uh, with their estimate that you know, investment in the energy sector may be down upwards of 20% in 2020 as a result of COVID-19. I think all of these things are issues that all of you are grappling with, and we would like to talk about today, whether COVID-19 and what we're experiencing today, both in terms of the energy and emissions impact, the investment impact, the behavioral impact, will this be a pivot point in our energy transition? And, and, and will we be in fact thinking about recovering greener and how do we go about doing that? Or is this going to be an asterisk year, right? One of those years that is like other financial crises we've experienced where there's impact, but it doesn't really change the overall course or trajectory uh, of the challenges uh, and opportunities we face. And so very privileged uh, to have uh, such an expert group of folks to talk about that today. Um, very quickly, I'd like to you know, start with a first round just to level set, make sure everybody understands where everybody is coming from and talk with each of you a little bit about how COVID-19 has impacted your uh, sector or your business or, or the, the country and, 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 and work that you represent. So maybe if I could, um, Bert, it would be good to, to start with you for the perspective from the Netherlands and what COVID-19 has meant uh, for, for you and, and your energy uh, planning. Okay, uh, Sarah, thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me the floor. And let me first uh, thank uh, Congressman Garrett for his, uh, for, his, uh, for his kickoff. I think it was a very inspiring one. And I hope that indeed we are on the same path, also, uh, uh, although we may have some, some different sideways to go. Uh, because I think that uh, as, at least large countries, but also large economic groups like the EU, have a special responsibility to do something about climate change and to do what they can uh, to, uh, to prevent that the world is running for a disaster. Um, then first, uh, COVID-19. It took us, I think, all a, a little bit by, by surprise. Uh, of course, it started and we could, we could have thought that it would also come to all, all, all our countries, but you never know what, what's going to happen. And of course, in the Netherlands, as, as in many countries, it's the severest crisis we ever saw. Uh, we always talk about the Great Depression so in the 30s of the, of the last century, but I think this is a little bit larger. But there's also a great, a, a, a large difference with the situation then, because in, in the 30s, it was a, a structural crisis and, and, and a sort of a, a shortage of effective demand. Uh, this is 
uh, quite has quite another uh, origin. Um, it, it and it took us in the midst of an economic upswing. I mean, uh, econo economics were uh, the economies were growing, uh, financial situation of, of countries of states was improving in, in the Netherlands. The, the, the state debt was, has been going down. So that's quite a different situation by then. And we're all now, think I think, puzzled about the question whether this will mean a kind of structural change or whether it be only an asterisk, as you say, a blink in hist of the history and in, in, in a year or five or so, uh, we, we could have been forgotten it. It's, 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 it's difficult to assess. We now see people working from home. At present, I'm working from home and, and, and I'm practically forbidden to come at the office. Uh, people are traveling le less and less. Uh, we, are uh, we are using these video conferences to talk to each other. And of course, a lot of, there's a lot more possible than we always thought. And the question is, will this be a structural change? Partly, I think. But we also rec we will also see that we need to meet really meet other people to have a good a different uh, to to have a good discussion and to feel and sense what people are thinking and working on. Um, at least it's our intention in the Netherlands to use this crisis um, to make a kind of leapfrog, uh, uh, so leapfrogging. A step to uh, to economic recovery and also greening uh, greening the economy. Um, uh, Ambassador Haspel's already mentioned our climate agreement, which has been concluded uh, in the midst of last year, um, in the midst of the year, and um, we are trying to to accelerate investments we had already planned. Uh, in the Netherlands, but also in Europe. What we what we see that it already works in transport, for example, more and more electric cars. There's a lot of research being done, and we are now uh, uh, establishing an investment fund just to stimulate um, these kind of investments, so that we do more and more investments, um, uh, driving the the, the 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 economy in a, in a greener way. But at the same time, of course. Uh, there are also parts of what we could call the old economy we don't want to get lost. Uh, for example, we support our national airline to to at least to to stay into business. So it's it's a mix of measures. Of basically, we are trying to find all kinds of ways to to use the opportunity to f further green the economy because it's it's one important goal is that we have an, uh, a climate neutral. Uh, energy supply in the in the 2050s, and I hope that uh, there's also the the, the target of um, of the United States. It was a very uh, optimistic message of Congressman Garrett. Garrett, and if I may conclude, uh, I would kindly invite him to uh, come back from uh, to, to come back to the to the Paris Agreement and to um, to start supporting it in the future. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Those are excellent starting comments. And when we come back, I'd love to talk a little more about uh, how to think about recovery in the context of the EU recovery plan that we're hearing so much about and so many details come out about. Um, but for now, I'd like to turn to Elizabeth. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a Shell is obviously one of the companies that folks recognize as uh, as having a, a relatively robust transition plan of your own. Uh, mm -hmm. And thinking about what this COVID nineteen crisis has meant for your core business and for some of your transition plans would be great to hear. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And also, first, uh, thank you so much to Congressman Graves and Ambassador Haspels. Uh, I have the unique pleasure to be an American living in the Netherlands here in The Hague, and so also really share the affinity of both of our wonderful countries. So in terms of Shell, of course, Shell is a global company. Uh, we are a very, very large company in the United States, and of course, headquartered here very proudly as Boeing World Dutch Shell here in the Netherlands. And when I think of COVID, and I think about that global reach, that something is really important. I run a global business, our new energies business with, with a broad scope of everything from our renewables business to, uh, as Congressman Graves acknowledged, uh, clean natural gas, um, pow integrated power, hydrogen, electric vehicle mobility, nature-based solutions, et cetera. So it's a broad breadth 
and it's also a global business. And so in terms of COVID, one of the first things as an employer with really a longstanding values is that it's about care for our employees, care for our partners, our contractors, our extended family of all of the individuals who share and lean in with us during these challenging times to keep essential energy in operation. And so one of the first and foremost things about COVID, I've been really working with you know, my teams around the world to make sure they and their families are safe. And so it's been a real, very humbling experience, quite frankly, to see from, we have families in Asia with employees all the way through to, you know, literally from China to California and everywhere in between. And so it's been really interesting for me on a personal level to have essentially that privilege of being in the living rooms and the home offices of my families all around the world and to see how COVID has come in different ways and has impacted our, our communities. And so from first and foremost, from that practical care perspective, the essential aspect of really helping each other, recognizing that we bring our whole human being to work. And so, so many of us, we've seen these stories around the internet where we're all trying to work from home. We have kids kids at home and, you know, you know, the four-year-old pops onto the video screen right in the middle of an important customer meeting or something. So I think one of the positive impacts of COVID is actually a great humanization of realizing, you know, I was, as a matter of fact, I was in a really important, uh, we were talking about the European Green New Deal, I was in a really important um, conversation with EB3, EVP Hans Timmermans earlier and his beautiful dog, you know, interrupted the meeting and jumped up onto his laptop. You know, so, so this humanization of recognizing that we're all in this together, this is unique because it's a global crisis. It, it impacts all of us, wherever we're from, so that's something that to me that has been a profound learning that I hope that we can rally in a positive basis. Practically speaking, in terms of Shell, again, it's a privilege as an energy provider around the world. We have, with the support of governments, had the privilege of continuous operation. We've been deemed as energy and essential service. So I'm very proud to say that we've continued uh, safe operations of all of our core energy assets around the world nonstop 24 seven. In some cases, this has required tremendous family sacrifice of our employees who have had to be out on ships or out on, on platforms, out at sea, at location for months at a time because of lockdown and travel restrictions. And so we've been really creative about having you know virtual meet and greets with families and so forth and trying to keep that human connection. But all our physical assets depend on the human beings that keep them operating. And then from a new energies perspective, we've continued with construction and safe construction. As a matter of fact, um, we're very, very proud that our Borsala 3-4 offshore wind project here in the Netherlands just achieved first power um, a few weeks ago. So we completed construction or we have a few more um, pieces of testing, but we've essentially completed construction right in the middle of COVID lockdown. And we've that is extended around the world from solar, natural gas, offshore winds, um, hydrogen installation, et cetera. So what we actually see, which leads into a comment you made earlier, Sarah, is that we're seeing actually a momentum, an increase of investment, an increase of, of interest from customers that pull through to build more projects, more investment, more demand, more competition for tenders and projects around the world. So even though the macro, of course, as an integrated company, it certainly hit our stock. And we see actually the demand destruction and the price drop that we saw across oil and gas really as a clear indicator that the energy transition is clearly accelerating. Thank you for those thoughts. I will say it, it's always interesting to me. Um, uh, we ask, a, we do a lot of polling questions when we're engaging with audience. We always ask the question, has COVID-19 accelerated or slowed down the energy transition? And by and large, people answer accelerated, which is interesting because you can see mixes of behavior in different parts of the world. But it really is this sense that, that, uh, that it is, particularly because uh, companies and governments are reconstituting their their pledge to move in that direction and their activities to go in that direction, there is some sustained momentum there, which is good. That's exactly right. And right in the middle of COVID, Shell announced its net zero emissions commitment to be net zero by 2050 or sooner. 
And I'll put an emphasis on the on sooner part, because as we can, with the support of governments and policy, align and we have our customers pulling with us, we will move at pace because we're a for-profit business. And so we can create that supply and demand and move, we will move as fast as we can. Absolutely. And um, I also did want to want to say thank you to the essential workers that, that you all are supporting. It is very important for us to recognize the energy sector plays that role. And so in, in a huge amount of work goes into making sure that that's safe work. So very much appreciate all of your workers and, and folks that are engaged in those efforts. Um, I want to turn to Mark because, uh, you know, Mark, maybe this is, it look, things may look different uh, from your perspective as, um, you know, uh, Shell is a, a large company with a portfolio of projects that, that you can sort of manage across the energy transition and the impacts from COVID. How do things look from, from your perspective and the projects that you manage at the, at the port? Well, thank you very much, Sarah. And of course, thank you to the ambassador and to the congressman for having me in this panel. Much appreciated. Yeah, it's, it's very typical. I work for a single, I think the single biggest CO2 reduction project in the Netherlands. It's a groundbreaking CCS project called Portos. And we are right in the middle of working towards a final investment decision with seven companies, three state-owned enterprises, which I work for, um, who are developing an infrastructure for CO2 transport and storage. But we need four industrial customers delivering CO2 to us. They have to make their own investment decisions. And right in the middle of that, we get COVID. And no one saw it coming. And uh, everybody has to decide to commit to our project. Um, on our side, we have to invest 500 million euros. I think that's about $600 million um, in the infrastructure. And I think our four industrial clients together will amount to about the same investment. That's quite a big investment. Uh, and uh, so, of course, when this happened and everything went into lockdown, uh, we sat down with our potential customers. One of us, one of them is represented here in the panel, uh, Elizabeth from Shell is uh, one of our potential customers. The other three are two American companies as well, Air Products and ExxonMobil, and a French uh, company, Air Liquide. And then we sat down with them because we saw the huge impact it had on them, at least theoretically, what will happen. It also affects us as state-owned enterprises, but I think we are pretty stable for now. But you can imagine a port, the port of Rotterdam is hugely affected by well, sort of a complete stop of transshipment of, well, economic business. And um, so we sat down with them and what we quickly noticed uh, was, well, apparently an even stronger ambition and even bigger drive to make this project a success, which was uh, fantastic to see and uh, really important, of course. Um, but it underlines the whole sentiment, I believe, in the Netherlands, but also in the European Union, that uh, we need to invest in projects uh, aimed at uh, CO2 reduction or at reaching our climate targets um, to get, well, to get, not only to get out of this crisis, but to stay relevant. And, um, and so that's what we were confronted with. But, well, as I say, it's still very exciting and um, we are getting closer to final investment decisions. So, of course, uh, for example, Elizabeth's board will still have to decide whether they will agree. But so far, it's, it's really, it's, well, it's, it's really, how do you say that in, in English? Um, uh, you get a warm feeling from the reaction of the customers that they are still strongly supporting this project and willing to invest and not hiding behind COVID as some sort of, well, oh, we're not sure and putting everything on the longer term, but no saying right now we need this project. So actually, it, yeah, as you just mentioned, it's not, of course, it's not a bonus for us. It's not a good thing. I mean, for no one, this could be mentioned or labeled a good thing, but it does seem to give an extra, um, also togetherness or something. We're in this together and we need to, to do this. So that's from my perspective, Sarah. Mark, could I just ask one follow-up question on that, which is, do you think that it's something that, um, a, a technical aspect of the project, something about where CCUS is and its evolution uh, in terms of market readiness, or, or is it something about the the moment and time that we're in that is keeping your your project going in the face of these sort of dire economic circumstances? Like I, I think back to the great financial crisis, right? W would you have expected the same outcome in that scenario as you do as you've experienced in this one? What do you think is the differentiating factor? 
I think the differentiating factor is the moment in time, because yes, the technology is more or less proven technology, but the way we are building a system is, well, unique in the world, putting all the systems together. So it hasn't been done anywhere, I believe, before. So, but I think it's the moment, and as uh, Bert and the ambassador both mentioned the climate agreement in the Netherlands, uh, our project is a huge part of that. So it's also sort of a, a proof to everyone that we still believe in the climate agreement and that we want to put our shoulders well, under the, the agreement. So I, I truly believe it's the moment in time, the momentum that uh, helps with this. That's great, Mark. And I'm, when we come back up for our next round, I want to talk a little more about the role of CCUS broadly and, and some interesting reports that have come out recently about how important CCUS is, but how behind we are relative to where we need to be and how we might be able to solve some of those issues. Sure. Great. Bob, uh, Bob, I know you really well, which is either a liability or a good thing in a panel discussion. Uh, but I know you focus on uh, on a broad range of issues, but particularly, you know, thinking a lot about what's happening in the United States these days and our transition to a, a low carbon future. Can you frame for us how you're thinking about COVID-19 and its impact on both the energy and the climate journey that we're on here in the U.S. and maybe as it relates to other countries? Sorry, I had to remember to take myself off mute. <laughs> um, well, thanks, Sarah. Uh, and thanks to the ambassador and Congressman Graves. And Sarah, thank, thanks to you too. You're doing a great job keeping us on point here. And I appreciate it greatly. You know, this is a, this is a difficult thing to really triangulate. I mean, I, I think comparing what happened in the great recession, let's say of 2009 to this is different because I think there's been a greater erosion of public trust in institutions. Because so many mixed messages, so many different approaches are being taken around the world to respond to something, as Bert and others have said, you know, we didn't fully grasp the full impact of what was coming at us. Um, and yet here we are, you know, slowly uh, moving forward, uh, not knowing exactly when we'll be able to, at least for me, when I'm gonna be able to ride in the Washington Metro again and feel comfortable about it, you know? So I think that's a little different this time and it's gonna be something that makes this a little more challenging. One of the things that I think um, is a huge advantage go right now, and, and I think you know, Elizabeth was a, a perfect example of this, as was Mark, um, businesses have not walked away. I mean, you know, in a, you know, in a simple slogan that sometimes you, you hear when you're in high school, uh, you know, they are chewing gum and walking at the same time. They know they have to deal with, uh, you know, the recovery itself. There's economic impacts, revenues are down, demand for, you know, petroleum products is, is down. Um, I could see the prices on, at the pump going down. Um, you know, all of these things are impacting companies, yet by and large, companies are not turning away from making commitments. And, and again, we've seen them over the last uh, several weeks and certainly all through uh, the summer, more and more aggressive um, uh, commitments. Um, the recovery um, opportunities here, I think are not insignificant. I mean, you have that momentum that isn't going away, um, but how can it be how can wind be put in the sails of that? And I think that's the big, the big question. And, and not only wind in the sails, but I mean, those of you who may have checked out uh, recent reports, for instance, from the World Economic Forum, is there a different way that capitalism should be looking at sustainability? And I, you know, you know, more broadly than just the shareholder and the profits, but but the sustainable growth. Uh, of the economy. And I think what we learned in, in, the, in the pandemic is that there's a, there was a, we were definitely in an economic growth period, but the, there was a frayed fragility to it. And, you know, with supply chains and, and inner, inner, you know, global, it, global connectivity um, was, uh, was, a, was apparent and it didn't have a sustainability component to it. It was done, there was a lot of interconnection, but it wasn't as sustainable as it could be. So I think all of this is weighing on how we might uh, 
marry up uh, some government incentives in action with the underlying continued uh, interest in, in, the, um, in the business world around the, around the globe to become more sustainable. And, and I think climate change is a big part of that. Obviously, they come together. So um, I, I think that's what I see. And, and in our own uh, nonprofit, which is does, does uh, thinking like you, you guys do over at CSIS, and um, we have found the companies we work with have come to us and said, look, we've been working, thinking about what do we need to do over the next 30 years? Let's take some of that thinking and translate it into what can be going on now that will set that up better. And so we've done a lot of work on that. And I think I'll, we'll probably get to some of those discussions, but I'll stop with that introduction. Yeah, let's come back to, to some of those items. I mean, I think that your frame of, uh, of uh, and your perspective that, that the companies that you work with uh, have been coming to you and saying, how do we use this as a catalytic moment is exactly where we'd like to go with uh, with this conversation. So let me come back to you on some of that work in, in a moment, Bob. Um, I, I do wanna ask a point very quickly though, Bob, can you characterize for, for me your perspective on how the US from a policy perspective has sort of a, looked to address this challenge. I think there's lots of different ways, as Congressman Graves was saying, of framing the U.S. Uh, both approach to climate, but also the U.S. approach to recovery from COVID. Um, maybe just a couple words on, on what you, you, you're perceiving there. Yes, and, and as you could probably tell, uh, Congressman Graves and I have had many conversations about this, um, and, and very good and robust ones. So uh, the the issues here really is, is, is somewhat like optionality. What, what can we be doing now that leaves more and more options open? Because we can't predict what's gonna be needed in 2045 or 2043. None of us can really, we know that we have to reduce emissions and we're aligned, but what technologies will be available? How advanced will they be? What do we need to be doing now? That working backwards gives you a, a lens of which to look at what could we be doing in a recovery period now that maintains and strengthens the ability for the for us to be resilient and, and have options as we go forward. And I think that's an important thing. And, you know, one of the things that is absolutely correct uh, and, and no disagreement at all on this is that the role of natural gas and fuel switching, if you want to be very uh, uh, agnostic about it, from a higher carbon coal to, uh, you know, like coal, fuel like coal to a lower one like uh, natural gas, that has been substantially what has reduced greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. There's other factors, including uh, you know, a, a deeper uh, growing penetration of renewable energy and more fuel efficient cars. You know, we, we, you know, the Congressman was talking about the power sector predominantly, but there were transportation and industry are, are combined way much more of the emissions than than the power sector, although the power sector must be decarbonized to, to help the other ones. So um, that is a big thing. And, and the question over there, and I'll just stop with this one because obviously we could go on about what should we do with automobiles? What kind of fuels should they be using? You know, What kinds of technologies do we need to deal with cement? <laughs> uh, but on power, what we're gonna face in the 2030s, in the 2020s, we're gonna probably reduce substantially, at least in the United States, coal. But in the 2030s, we have to deal with what do we do with the emissions from the natural gas turbines and, and all the other industries that have switched to natural gas as their heat source. And so carbon capture is one of those, but then there may be another round of fuel switching to hydrogen or something else. But that's the area we should be focusing on because we're gonna, we can make those reductions now, but then we have to be prepared and be open about the fact that we need to deal with those other emissions in the next decade. Great, thank you. And I want to get into some of those particular sort of technological challenges uh, in, in sector-based challenges in, in this next round. I, I, I want to point out each of you has made a comment more or less to the extent that that uh, that there's there's been a, a recommitment to priorities from a number of uh, governments and a number of uh, voices in the private sector. The, I, not to be the skunk of the garden party, but you know, recommitment is, is, is wonderful in the face of the, of the sort of crisis that we, we are facing. 
the only problem is we needed to raise ambition too, right? So, so we needed to also think about how are we going to reach even more ambitious goals in the context of uh, of dealing with global climate and 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 by and large are behind in that context. So how we approach this opportunity as a pivot point, as a catalyst, as you guys have all pointed out, is not a small topic, right? It is in fact uh, a pretty big thing that I know each of you is grappling with in your own way. So I'd like to get into some of the details of that if we could. Um, maybe starting again with Bert from the from the perspective of the Netherlands, you know, government within the context of this very, uh, uh, um, uh, no, it, uh, a, notor a notoriable plan that we've heard a lot about coming out of the EU to really think about building back uh, in a greener way and, and green recovery. What are some of the, 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 the benefits that have come from that sort of EU-wide approach? Are there challenges in there that you would point out? And, and also importantly for the context of this conversation, is there what what does the EU need from partners and and other countries around the world to to be working with towards those goals? So not small questions, but if you could kind of go through some priorities you see in that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, indeed, there are, there are not small kind of small questions. Well, I'll uh, I'll try to to answer a few of them. Um, first, uh, when we go when we look to um, to the EU, we are trying to really have a have a recovery uh, a, a green recovery uh, as part of the green deal in fact we see green deal as an important uh, factor and um in and and in, in, in the recovery in the right way uh, maybe if it's it's useful to 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 mention a few elements because uh, recently there is a there, we, we we had we got a, a climate law not only in the netherlands but it's also um, the aim to 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 uh, give, give uh, all all the work in, ter in terms of uh, reducing greenhouse gases uh, a more obligatory character to 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 ha and and have a climate law, but there are also other uh, other strategies on bio uh, uh, biodiversity, circular economy, farm to fork strategy, on sustainable food production, a renovation wave. It it's concerns also, also also of course the energy efficiency of buildings energy system integration and, and all these kind of things. So it's not only uh, just 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 one plan, but there are different strategies underlying under it, uh, of which a climate uh, law is an important one because we are going to to define and to, to fir firmly formulate that the EU will be uh, just as, as individual countries like the Netherlands, a climate neutral uh, uh, area in, in, in 2050. Uh, what's important for that is that we do everything, put everything in that framework. So we, we just accepted, uh, for example, a multilateral uh, financial framework in the EU. And it, it has been uh, determined that every every measure or most measures have to fit in that. So that, that which means that uh, then that no polluting uh, 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 technology will be will be financed anymore. And when you look at uh, the the money that's involved with it, is about 750, 750 billion uh, euros. And that's quite quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of money. So that's that's directed to uh, new investments, new technologies, new re research and development. Uh, that's one. That's the second report. So climate law, uh, multi-annual framework, and the third one is that uh, the possibilities and the opportunities of the different EU countries are not evenly distributed, and that's the reason that we have a just transition fund to help the countries uh, that need a little bit more support uh, for for making the transition. And by and large, we think that uh, traveling this path. Um, we try to. We were going to use the moment, the momentum. Of course, we we, we were not longing for such a, such a recession as we have now. Of course, but we have to use this this momentum, and we are going to use it in, in very different ways. Um, that's not to say, of course, that it's that it's easy. It, it's, it's by far it's by far e not easy. Uh, it's by far easy. Sorry. Uh, but at least this combination of things uh, is going to help us uh, to come a little bit a bit further in uh, in using uh, in using the opportunities we have. Um, if that's 
the start of the question, uh, please ask me as you have any follow-up questions. No, that's wonderful. Thank you, Bert. And, and, and uh, uh, I think it is really notable in particular how the EU is grappling with the concept of just transitions. It's something that is a conversation in many parts of the world, thinking about how the energy transition is very profound and, and how it is unevenly felt in different parts of the world. And so I think there's a lot of folks watching the European experience on that. Maybe just if you might, one or two more words on the idea of, of what kind of collaboration and cooperation the EU is seeking in achieving these goals. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of focus put on, uh, you know, the potential for things that would raise conflict like border carbon adjustments and things because, you know, the EU is moving so quickly and aggressively towards deep decarbonization that they, people tend to focus on potential areas of conflict, which are I'm happy to have you talk about if you want to. But really, you know, what are some of the things in particular, maybe from a transatlantic sense that you think are important to um, emphasize? I think by far the most important issue is, of course, a technological cooperation. Uh, when we when we look about and as Congressman Garrett also said something about it, when you look about new technologies, for example hydrogen, I think we need each other because we are setting a new a whole new value chain. We, we are now designing a whole new value chain from the present we call it grey hydrogen made uh, made from fossil fuels to green hydrogen uh, made by uh, with uh, with uh, renewable energy. Uh, and I think these these are the, the, the great steps we have to, to we have to, to 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 make, and there's already a lot of cooperation between uh, the Netherlands, Germany, Japan, and also the U.S. So I think these are the most important. These are very very much important things uh, to uh, collaborate with, um, and also I think issues like uh, CCUS that has been mentioned. I think it's a very important step to develop that further, and Mark can 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 more. Um, illustrate what, what's going to happen, what, what is happening there. But I think at least for a certain um, number of years, we need to have this uh, CCUS in order to at least to reduce um, emissions or emissions to the atmosphere, as long as we don't not yet, we, we are not yet managing it, do it, reducing it in another way. Excellent. So Thank I, you so I much. think technology is the most most important thing. Uh, to further collaborate with. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Elizabeth, I wanted to go to you with a, a, a similar sort of technology oriented question, but one about your portfolio, your ambition and sort of the, the new energy, um, <clears throat> excuse me, new energy businesses uh, at, at Shell. Can you talk a little bit about what's in that portfolio and and what what some of your aspirations are and and whether COVID nineteen has caused you to rethink uh, any of that? I think there's a lot of interest from folks in how companies such as yours are either adjusting plans or doubling down on plans in in the wake of the situation we find ourselves in. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And, and first of all, building up my earlier comments, uh, the bravery and the boldness of the RDS board is clear. I'll share a quick story that uh, right in the height of the middle of our COVID lockdown in April, when things were really kind of in peak crisis mode and with a lot of uncertainty, um, as we do in, with any large investment, I took a multi-billion dollar investment to our board uh, for approval in this space. And I thought, well, you know, <laughs> we had just uh, made the very hard decision to rebaseline our dividend make some very extreme measures on cost and affordability to protect our financial framework. And so it's not exactly what you think is the, the easy time to bring this multi-billion dollar type of um, new energies investment to our board, but I did, the investment was approved. And to me, that marked a really clear signal of confidence and commitment unanimously where our board of directors is, recognizing that it is essential, like I said before, that we really accelerate and continue on the pathway to change that we're doing. And, and it also builds on a really important point um, that Congressman Graves mentioned, which is that technology, we need optionality. We need fit for purpose. It's gonna make sense within the resources and the climate of the particular region. And so something that's going to work, for example, around the North Sea offshore wind basin or the Eastern, Europe, Eastern US wind basin is not gonna work 
for a landlocked portion of the middle of, of the Midwest in the United States or a place, for example, in the middle of Africa or somewhere else. And so we need to take a very practical approach, I think, to energy transition and policy and make sure that we're aligning ourselves with having practical options and encourage affordability. You asked about our, our portfolio and and I also see the Congressman's comment in the, in the chat box there. I wanna share something that we're very proud of as well, which is our commitment to energy access in the developing world. We recognize that one of the ways to lift people out of poverty, to really have human sustainability is to be able to have affordable access to energy. And so one of the things that we've done, we had already been building a, a business in energy access, but due to COVID, there has been a disproportional impact on, on those societies um, that are really, most on the fringe of, of really having basics in their life. And so we've uh, granted over $1.7 million to um, emerging distributed energy companies across um, India, Kenya, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, and Uganda. And that's really important because those are families that are, we are reaching that would otherwise pivot very easily into subsistence crisis. And so one of the things that we're doing at Shell is yes, we're building really big, exciting assets like HKN Wind Farm in the Netherlands or Mayflower um, on the Eastern seaboard of the United States. Mayflower, for example, will provide over 804 megawatts per annum of wind, which powers half a million homes in the state of Massachusetts. So big projects like that, but then all the way down to the scale of really practical distributed energy in, in communities such as in Tanzania or Kenya, where otherwise they would have no um, access to basic lighting for education or for healthcare, um, to run basic medical equipment and everything in between. So if you think about what's really, I think, essential from a policy perspective, and this is what I'm really proud of what the Netherlands is doing in the European Union and the United States, really bravely focusing on what are the right problems we're trying to solve in a practical way? What are the outcomes we're trying to achieve? and then be able to have the right fit for purpose you know, solution. So for example, we think about hydrogen. Uh, we need all the colors of the rainbow of hydrogen. We need to transition. We need blue hydrogen produced by CCUS. One of the things that is fantastic that um, the Dutch and German governments have done recently is they have approved policy that allows us to reuse existing infrastructure. You talk about affordability, part of how we're gonna do that is actually very practically to reuse part of the existing gas network, to be able to use our refineries such as Pernas, to be able to help that switch to be a sink for hydrogen that we produce um, whether it's from blue hydrogen through CCUS or green hydrogen from um, renewable resources into that mix and then be able to reuse existing asset base. And that, that helps bring the cost down for the end customers. And these, these very practical measures about having policy that is able to reuse infrastructure, align incentives that we are actually creating supply and demand at the same time. So we need positive incentives that keep the technology optionality alive because you know each country each location each industry has a very different use case cement has a, excuse me the cement industry has a very different use case you know than an individual consumer on a home so we need that flexibility because there is no silver bullet in the energy transition and frankly that's also why a diversified energy integrated company like shell i think is best positioned to succeed because we have that breadth and that practicality to meet customers where they are I want to ask you one follow up question on that, because I think um, one, one interesting point you oftentimes hear in dialogues like this, that, you know, it, it, ambition and high level goals are like really important. And I agree, I think they are very important, but there's also sort of an implementation and practicality phase here, which is how do you make the most of the infrastructure you have? So this isn't a costly transition, right? So that it is a transition that we can afford and we can implement. And I think that's really important. You, you mentioned at the end, though, the Shell portfolio and an integrated energy company. And, you know, I think COVID-19 has only exacerbated this interest in how traditional energy companies such as Shell will make that transition into these, you know, integrated energy companies. There's almost been a huge amount of time with people who are trying to speculate about which kind of technology is going to win in that, you know, portfolio, which one you will prioritize as a company over others. And then also, 
how you're going to make money and survive as a business in the context of that transition. Has COVID-19 taught you anything about that strategy in particular, or is there something you'd like to share about the, the, the view of why having the optionality and the flexibility is important versus picking the technology that is going to be sort of the future where oil and gas companies can play a role? Yes, Sarah, that's a great question. It actually builds on something that Barrett was sharing a minute ago, is that one of the things that the Dutch government has done is provide some certainty of path of direction. And so what's really important for a company, we need to, in order, we need to have a certainty of a direction to make investment decisions because these assets, whether it's CCUS, offshore wind renewables, you know, a flexible natural gas um, plant, all of these different technologies, these physical assets, they have a long lifetime. And not only do they have a long lifetime for use, but they also, um, they take a couple of years to build. <laughs> and so being able to have the certainty of a pathway of governments, having policy that's clear um, with outcomes that are aligned is essential for businesses like ours to be able to then invest with confidence or shareholders dollars and to be able to have the alignment of positive return. And so, all, so it is really a partnership between policy and the bravery and clarity of policymakers around the world. And again, in a fit for purpose way, um, that is really important for us. And being able to then have positive incentives that create the pull on the demand side for customers. So equally, we need incentives that motivate customers, for example, to make choices around their vehicles that they would drive, for example. Also, we need incentives that drive the production of supply in particular directions because these big assets are expensive to build, they're complicated to build, they take many years to build and permit, um, and then they also will operate for 30 plus years. And so, and so this is where that alignment between policy and, and private companies such as Shell become really important and it really is a partnership. And so to your point about COVID, and what we were talking about earlier, my earlier points about the common humanity, I think the beautiful thing about this crisis, not that we would ever want a crisis, but the beautiful thing is we're coming together as communities, as countries, as businesses, as partners, um, financial institutions, all of the actors are needed. And it's really clear across, it takes a village. It's really true. And so as we, as we come in together to solve these problems, to have a cleaner transition, to keep our economies whole, to have meaningful employment, and that goes back to the essential workers in, in energy, those are good jobs. They're certain and secure jobs. And so all these puzzle pieces come together, I think, to help us make that progress. And so COVID to me has been, if anything, I'm a great optimist. And to me, COVID's about how do we find those practical solutions together? That's great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, before I turn to Mark and, and Bob for a couple more questions, I do want to remind uh, our guests participating in the conversation, you can ask questions using the Q&A function. I don't, you can't use the chat to ask questions, but please do put some questions in the Q&A uh, uh, function and we will uh, make sure we get to those in, in the discussion. Mark, I want to turn to you for a minute because I think one of the the challenges, you know, digging down into a, a talk, the technology that many of you have brought up, CCUS, it, not new, right? Something we've been working at for quite a period of time. How do we get from a place and what are we learning from your project in particular that helps us learn about how to, to scale CCUS as an option? And you know, I, I imagine some of this partnership that Elizabeth just talked about is a really important component there, but I wanted to get some your perspective on, on how do we think about particular projects like yours and the lessons that we learn from it to think about scaling the technology more broadly? Um, yeah, well, I think just to start off on answering that question, I think you have to put it into perspective of, in this case, the Rotterdam port area, um, where it's part of a whole strategy of decarbonization of industry. Um, and I think it's important to state to clearly state there's not much use in doing just CCUS. You have to do all the rest as well. Because as Bert already mentioned, and I think everyone is aware, I mean, we need CCUS. Almost every single scenario um, shows that and underlines it, uh, but mainly to stay within the carbon budget that's, that's remaining. Uh, I mean, it's not a real transition uh, technology, of course. So you need it to, while you're still developing real transition um, technologies. And um, 
So in the Netherlands, there's a lot of focus on CCUS becoming too big. So you ask about scaling up CCUS. Uh, yeah, we believe we need more CCUS, but there's a lot of um, yeah reluctance to support CCUS. Uh, some NGOs are still opposing uh, CCUS uh, because they're afraid that it will sort of well give give industry a, a pathway to not invest in the rest in the real transition. I think we can clearly show that that's a rubbish, uh, to put it uh, in our direct Dutch way. Um, uh, we have about 25 megatons of CO2 emissions in the Rotterdam area per year. Our project tries to reduce two and a half megatons per year um, towards 2030 and even a bit longer. And that shows that 10 percent, it's a big chunk, but it also shows there's a much more needed than just our project. Uh, and, uh, well, you can discuss endlessly about lock-in effects, uh, but the clear thing is that if we don't do this now, these emissions will just keep on being emitted. Uh, because that's the good thing. The Dutch government has put in, an, um, on paper, fantastic su subsidy scheme for CCUS, amongst other technologies, where industry can uh, get, um, well, the whole price difference between our project and the cost of the CO2 allowances, where they can get subsidy for that, which is on paper fine. But they've also, and I think that's that's a good thing, they've also said we will only provide it towards those industries where there are really no short-term alternatives. So, for example, coal-fired power plants in our country are excluded from that subsidy scheme. But refineries such as Shell, hydrogen production, is still included. A lot of sectors are still don't have any any alternative. As I heard, the cement industry, the steel industry. So it's a, it's potentially, and we think scaling up is, is necessary. We know other regions around us, also other countries, the Belgians, the Germans, are very much looking at Rotterdam, what we are developing, because they also want to develop uh, CCUS, but they don't have the offshore storage possibilities, and that's a huge difference as well. So we want to be. We are very much focused on getting this done, but also to to uh, share knowledge with everyone who wants to develop a project like this in an industrial cluster where you have multiple customers providing CO2 to a single infrastructure, which is in effect the thing that hasn't been done anywhere, I believe, so far, but could be also uh, cost efficiently, uh, looking at it from a cost efficiency perspective, the, the best thing to do. And um, but. I've been doing this now for three years, and what we notice is we get, there's so much talk about CCUS and, and other technologies for that matter. I truly believe we need projects to show that it really works and that you can drive costs down by, by learning and getting more projects. And that's something that also in the Netherlands, sometimes we're very good at keep talking, uh, but we need to, to do the business as well. I hope that gives a little answer to your question. It does. It does. I was going to say we talk a lot here in the United States, too. So I feel like that's just a phenomenon of being human. But uh, I, yeah. I, I do think your perspective, though, on the uniqueness of the application of uh, the uh, a, an industrial cluster at a port with industrial emissions reduction is perhaps the replicable thing uh, or the scalable thing about the experience you're going through, right? I mean, how how difficult do you think it would be for other ports around the world to be able to replicate some of what you're doing? Well, I think we have a pretty ideal location because yes, we're a big port in Europe, as the ambassador rightly said. So usually I say we're big, we're big, but from a CCS perspective, it's quite a small area. It's about 30 miles in length and you have all this industry very densely uh, together. Uh, and on top of that, we have the offshore empty gas fields, the depleted gas fields, well, almost right on our doorsteps, about 20 kilometers, which I believe is about uh, 13 miles or something. Um, well, that gives a huge advantage uh, from a cost perspective. I believe as a concept, it's very much replicable, I think you say in English. Uh, as long as you have this industry together, you have the, the, the port, the, the area where you can lay down an infrastructure and you have some access to storage, which doesn't have to be only a depleted gas field, can also be another aquifers or what you call them. So I think it's very replicable, replicable. Well, we can hope we can set a, we hope we can set an example for others to learn and, and to come to us and uh, 
uh, want to learn from us. Yes, we already get a lot of interest, we notice internationally as well. So. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank Bob, you. I'm turning to you for a second. Um, and I, you've done a lot of work on all these technology specific um, uh, decarbonization pathways as well. But maybe from a from the, that intersection between policy and uh, and the private sector, what are the kinds of things we need to see, particularly in the U.S. case, to be able to turn this from an asterisk moment to a to a pivot moment? And where do you see their opportunities on the horizon for that to happen? Well, I mean, we started the conversation earlier talking about recovery from the COVID-driven recession, and we've been talking broadly about perhaps some of the energy transition issues over the next 20, several decades. So again, working backwards, what can we do now that will create jobs um, and put us on some of these paths for the optionality as Elizabeth talked about and, and, and others. So I, I think there's a real opportunity if in the United States, if the Congress turns its attention to recovery at another level right now, obviously they're trying to figure out whether they want to do that or not. And I, and I also think you know, the, 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 the funding that Congress has provided so far in the last six or seven months has really been properly focused. And I think we need to say this on the immediate needs, you know, job, uh, 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 unemployment, unemployment insurance, health insurance, uh, you know, um, uh, protection of jobs at, at, uh, in small uh, businesses, uh, funding for uh, equipment at hospitals, you know, those things needed to be done and, and trillions of dollars were diverted to, to, to that. Um, you know, the, the amount of additional funding that can go to some of these other things is obviously being debated now, but there are, there, as that debate proceeds, there's still more that needs to be done on jobs and, 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 uh, and insurance and, and things of that nature that stabilizes our society but we can start thinking about that broader recovery, I think, pretty soon. Perhaps it'll have to wait to the next Congress, but there are plenty of things that can be done on infrastructure, on you know, everything from uh, charging station infrastructure for electric vehicles, uh, transmission lines to move renewable energy around offshore or from offshore or to, uh, to onshore or from the middle of the country where there's wind resources to the coastal areas or the southern part of the country where there's people, more people, um, energy efficiency. Again, there's lots of opportunity there for jobs. And so you got to look at these ideas that create jobs but all, and economic activity, but also ha have a potential for uh, improving the situation with um, climate, with greenhouse gas emissions. So, and also dealing with vulnerable communities. I think this has come up several times here, but the vulnerable communities, I, you know, are, you know, there's three sort of main focuses there from my perspective, those who are gonna be affected from the transition from one kind of energy economy to another, you know, let's say a, a small town that relies on the taxes from a coal fired power plant. Um, you know, what's gonna happen in that town? Uh, the, the communities that are o overly burdened by pollution and then how are they going to benefit from the benefits of the clean energies that could be equitable. And then those vulnerable communities are gonna be impacted by the impacts of climate change itself, which is already happening. So you got all those things mixed in there. There's real opportunity to make some investments in all of those things. And let me say one last thing here about this moment. Um, in time, you know, the idea that maybe we can pivot not just from like, how can we spend more money on energy efficiency, which I'm in favor of, but that that by itself is a thing as opposed to a, a look at a bigger opportunity to create a more sustainable economy. And, you know, as difficult as that for, is for some people to think about and what the regulatory and le legal um, certainty that Elizabeth rightfully points to, and is a, this is a golden opportunity where and look, I used to be the deputy administrator of EPA, so I'm a recovering regulator, right? So, um, you know, there's a real opportunity here instead of, of Congress passing a law with giving somebody like EPA or the counterparts in Europe and other parts of the world a list of things to tell businesses to do uh, and then passing regulations telling them how to do it. We have a situation here where businesses want to do something. Can the policies be what can help them do it? It's a flip. And, and we have an opportunity 
if we have an administration who wants to deal with climate change, and I, you know, that it could be a reelected current one or it could be a new one, they both could have an epiphany. But um, I'll take a deep breath there and then move on. So the, uh, but the, um, but the opportunity there is for businesses not to go into the immediate defensive mode if regulations and all that kind of talk starts, which it will. Um, and then says, all right, we're going to roll up our sleeves. We want to get this stuff done. How can we get this stuff to be helping us? So I think that's an opportunity here as well in the recovery period. Right, that's I great. Those are. I know those are those are excellent those are excellent uh, uh, comments. I I want to turn to a couple of questions that we've gotten uh, from the audience. We may not be able to get through all of them, but um, one in particular uh, we've mentioned a lot of technologies today. I don't think geothermal has come up. We do have a question specifically about efforts uh, towards geothermal, both in the Netherlands and in the U.S. Uh, Bert, I'm not sure. Can I put you on the spot to maybe uh, give an answer to that uh, question in particular, and then if anybody else would like to uh, just signal to me and I'll, I'll make sure you get in on the answer. Well, I'll just say, yes, oh. that, that, that there's no doubt that geothermal has a great role to play. It already is being used in some locations. It's got great opportunities and, and we should all be thinking about it. I mean, I built a nature center in Connecticut uh, that you know helped get it built when I was working for the Audubon Society that has a geothermal System. So it doesn't, you know, it's a different kind. It's it's just tapering the energy use. But you know, there's lots of opportunities, you know, all over the world. You know, uh, you don't have to think about you know Yellowstone or or Iceland, you know, in this in this regard. So yeah, I think it's definitely something that needs to be part of the mix of the optionality. Great, thanks, Bob. I always learn something new about you every time we talk. No, didn't know about the Nature Center in Connecticut. Um, uh, Bert, do you want to talk about this from the perspective of the Netherlands? Uh, just, just a word. I think ge geothermal is very important. Um, we are also working on that, although we don't. It's not not yet that big. Uh, but what do we see? And I saw a question of uh, Henk Kelsma of that, and and I typed something about it. We used to have, and we still have, uh, by the way, our energy management company, which is a state-owned company, uh, which is investing in all kinds of, in all. Of at least has the possibility to invest in all, uh, oil and gas um, exploration production in the Netherlands, and it has done that. But what we see now is that uh, the production opportunities for oil and gas, especially for gas in the Netherlands, is uh, uh, is is reduced, is reducing very much. We are closing, uh, gradually closing our last last largest production field, and also in the in the, in the North Sea, there's not so much. Uh, we see this company uh, uh, doing uh, more and more activities on geothermal. And it's not so strange, of course, because they used to be very, uh, very uh, knowledgeable in times of, of seismic and, and, and doing anything in uh, subsoil um, uh, inventories and, and, and activities. Uh, so what we see recently is that they use this knowledge to to improve uh, what we are going to do, what we're doing, in in terms of uh, geothermal. So I th I think it's it's closely connected, um, and I hope that more countries are going to do that. Of course, it, it, it's for us it's also a little bit a, a, a byproduct of the fact that production is going down, mm -hmm. uh, but I would want uh, that more, much more produ producing countries. Would look to the opportunities to to uh, to invest in geothermal and combine it, for example, also with heat pumps and all these kinds of technologies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Anybody else have any comments on that? If not, um, just to I just to note, just building on what Bert was saying, I mean, we're involved with geothermal in the Netherlands, and it comes back to this principle about fit for purpose based on resource capability in particular location because whether it's CCUS or geothermal, different technology or direct air capture, all these different technologies are going to optimally work depending upon certain environmental and physical attributes. And so one of the things, I, just to sum up what I said before, is it's really important to be able to have those options. And so where it makes sense, it's a great solution. Um, but this is where, from a Michelle perspective, you know, yes, we're involved in geothermal, we see that in a fit for purpose way, same with CCUS, same with offshore wind, you know, solar, for example. And when you say solar, you know, there's different, all different types 
of solar as well, um, in terms of concentrating solar rooftop behind the meter, et cetera. You know, and so this is, this is, I think, one of the things that is a huge importance when we think about energy transition and a lot is taking a systems view and a very practical view to make sure that we are giving ourselves the ability to apply the best technology for the best use cases in the best location, because that's what is going to enable, um, shall, shall I say, all, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. That's where we're going to keep the affordability balance as well and making sure that we can reuse infrastructure, like I said before. And so, you know, the thing that, you know, again, it gets a little frustrating sometimes is when folks get all the way down the rabbit hole of one particular technology over the other, because it's actually these different technologies are different and they have really important use cases and purposes, you know, for different uses. So that's what's been really, I think, exciting about this panel discussion, Sarah, is bringing that out. No, absolutely. Thank you for that uh, for that comment. Um, we we have another question uh, that I think I'll go to Bob for first. But I, Elizabeth, you may have some thoughts and 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 uh, others as well. We, we had a question very specifically, uh, sort of ripped from the headlines. Uh, uh, the California um, uh, 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 proposal not to buy any internal combustion engine vehicles uh, post uh, twenty. 30, I believe it was, right? 2030? 2030. Um, and uh, 2035. Yeah, I hate when people were doing these five, 35. I have to, it's a lot more things. Um, uh, so what, I think the question was explicitly about sort of the economics of that proposal, which I'm sure we could debate on a, a bunch of different levels, but I had two questions. One is uh, thinking about uh, internal, uh, one, California, and thinking about California's aspirations to, to and its experience in, in, in getting there and, and how the internal combustion engine piece fits into that overall framework. Um, it, it, to be completely honest with you, uh, in the context of California having a rough few uh, weeks, if not months, uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, so how should we think about that California announcement, maybe, Bob? And then, um, and then two, this, this policy mechanism of an internal combustion en engine sale ban, right? Can we talk a little bit about the, any thoughts on the utility of of policies like that in the transportation sector in particular? Is that a useful thing to do? Does it send us that kind of signals that both businesses and policymakers need for follow-up policies and making investments and things like that? So maybe Bob, if you could start and then, I don't know, Elizabeth, if I could put you on the spot to maybe talk about it too, and then happy to work in Bert and Mark as well. All right, well, that that's a whole panel there. Yeah, I know, I, sorry. I just want that on the record here, but, but let me try to quickly say something on the economics. I, I, I think, um, fuel cell electric motor driven vehicles are probably a little bit behind on this, but battery electric vehicles are probably going to get closer to, you know, and again, this is in the eye of the beholder, cost parity. And I think, you know, um, BP's economic outlook and shells as well sort of see this sometime in the mid 20s. Um, they're, they're less to maintain. Uh, for uh, the consumers, and obviously they they have a different kind of operational expense, and they're there. But the key the key with the automobiles is is that people are going to buy automobiles between now and 2050. People are going to buy about two cars, you know, as a general quarter. So I think I think because I haven't talked to, to anybody there, but I think what they're looking at at 2035 is about a 15 year turnover for all the cars. I mean, you know, there's always some that go longer, but but the bulk of vehicles on the road today while we're talking will be not on the road 15 years from now in the United States. And that's including the secondary markets for used vehicles and everything else. So I think what they're looking at is to try to have all electric vehicles by 2050, which is, you know, if you want to get to zero emissions in that time frame globally or in the United States, you're, you're not going to be able to have a lot of carbon emitting surface transportation out there. You're going to have to transition it. Now, where it gets its electricity from, you know, we've already talked about turbines and carbon capture. Where it gets hydrogen from, if it's got a fuel cell, it could be from methane or it could be from water. You know, methane's got more hydrogen on it than water, just pointing that out. But um, there's a lot of opportunities there. But in terms of the cost of the consumer, people are going to buy a new car. And so they buy this car or that car, I, I don't think it's a, I, I think, that's not a, there's not a huge expense, particularly as the costs are getting closer. That said, 
uh, there is an infrastructure cost. And recently the California Public Service Commission, and I don't think that's the exact name of it, has just authorized a number of the utilities there to start spending tens of millions of dollars on electric infrastructure. This has been a, you know, for, for charging infrastructure. So there has to be a big investment. This is another one of the public private partnership. There has to be a big investment in some of that infrastructure. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, you know, um, on the policy of mandating one kind of technology over other, my preference, I mean, I think we need to get to where that says, but um, my preference would be a performance standard, which would then also instill a little bit of incentives for innovation as well. So you would have a declining performance standards in the emissions out of the tailpipe over a period of time, not a cafe standard, I'm talking about grams per mile of greenhouse gases, and that declines down and it could go to zero in 2035 and then you know whatever people have been able to invent to do that they could use i'll stop that's great bob you did a whole panel in just uh, in three minutes <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth. I, I, I totally agree bob it could be a whole panel and i'm a californian so uh, i'll have to really restrain myself because i could talk about a whole panel and i was also for full disclosure i was a founding board member on the um, electric vehicle council with uc davis um, in my earlier days and have been intimately involved with um, policy formation in California going back a decade um, from, you know, so, so know it well. And, and actually um, the governor recently gave a shout out to Shell actually as part of that announcement because we've been early investing in both the electric vehicle infrastructure and hydrogen fueling infrastructure in California. And, and this is our partnership with the OEMs as long as Shell. And it's, it's actually something that is, is really, really amazing about Shell in that, in that partnership. And so one of the things on the fuel side, performance fuels, we've really advanced the chemistries dealing with the points about performance and lower emissions and so forth for the ICE engines. And then now as we transition to electric or electric um, fuel cell with hydrogen, so too, you know, we really see, it goes back to a comment I made earlier, that the clarity of policy and the alignment with, with, in this case, the OEMs is essential if you want to have the transition. You have to, because if you think about an OEM, the certainty that they need to begin to switch transmissions and engine types and, and so forth. And then the partnership that we have to have, and this is the partnership that we built with Toyota in California, for example, around hydrogen fueling stations, is that the business model depends on utilization. It's a chicken and egg. You have to provide the fact for consumers, they have to know that they can have the fuel at this easy. And then the automaker needs to know that the consumer is comfortable. Range anxiety has to be solved, whether it's electric or um, hydrogen electric. Um, and so it's a chicken and egg. And so our partnership with Toyota in California is a really good example of that. We built the partnership um, together so that as Toyota's brought its Mirai into California. We're building the charging infrastructure. We're, bound, we're tightly coordinated and sharing data so that we're right-sizing all along the number of fueling stations with the number of cars sold and, and so forth. And so that's part of why we also recently won another grant from the state of California, from the California Air Resources Control Board. So this, and, and the point that Bob made about, about grid infrastructure is really, really important as well, because, you know, essentially, um, tapping up an electric vehicle, even with level one charging, is actually the equivalent of a whole new house entering the distribution grid. And so what this does is it also requires very creative in application of innovation technologies, including software, um, to make sure that you actually have things like smart charging so that you can keep the stabilization of the grid at the node of those neighborhoods and where those houses with the new EVs are plugging in, for example. So it's actually quite a bit of complexity that, that you have to get into thinking from a systems perspective and providing a range of solutions together. And this is also when we think about renewables and electric vehicles and so forth, again, from a shell perspective, what we're doing, and we have this with our company, um, Green Lots in the United States is our electric vehicle charging company and new motion in Europe. What we're actually doing is we're actually working with the transmission and distribution companies and we're actually providing a software driven 
electric vehicle charge point infrastructure solution to help the network companies stabilize the grid, provide frequency regulation and voltage control, edge of grid. That becomes, so you begin to see that we're solving not just for the end consumer, but actually you have to solve for the system simultaneously to do that. So for example, here in the Netherlands, um, our new motion company is actually offering services to tenant um, to make sure that the grid is stable as we're charging and then, then green lots in California and, and also um, around the United States. So what's really important coming, this, coming back to your question is, and this is what California has done well, is taking a systems approach and aligning the timing of incentives for the automakers, for production, and for consumers, like you know, with the ability to use the um, what do they call them, the high occupancy vehicle lanes, you know, for commuting and so forth, aligning those incentives on the customer side with incentives on the system side, because we have to bring both along the supply and demand. We have to solve those concurrently for society. And just I think another note on COVID, coming all the way back to your beginning question, Sarah. One of the things we're seeing from our data is that because of COVID, people have a, a growing fear of using public transportation. So I think one of the challenges as a society we're going to have to solve together is how do we make people feel safe? We need public transportation. We need the decarbonization of public transportation also as we also enable individual consumer transportation. So we're seeing actually the demand for, for new vehicles um, actually increase the utilization of people's current vehicles actually increase because of COVID because people feel safe they want that privacy from a from a disease contagion perspective so as we nest all these issues in together I think again it becomes incumbent to take a systems view take a very practical approach of balancing both the supply and demand and I think that's something that California has done a really good job of and the European Union is doing a great job of that as well. That's excellent. The very rich comments to that question, which is quite warranted because as you said, there's just a lot of technical aspects that go into actually implementing the transition uh, that we've been talking about. Um, you know, whenever someone asks me to moderate a panel, I always judge uh, the the offer on the basis of the quality of the panelists and you guys have been fantastic. Uh, the only uh, the only downside here is we only have uh, uh, an hour and a half to be able to talk about a very complex topic. And unfortunately we've reached uh, the end of that period. I will say, you know, it does seem from the perspectives, if I might say, you know, across the range here, that we are seeing sort of a commitment to changes in the real economy and that on a policy level, it's really important to be able to engage and meet those changes in, in, those, in that, that sort of energy, uh, not to use a pun, but uh, to, to, to engage with that, to enable it to sort of, you know, continue going with the transition. And so I think that that's an important takeaway for everybody that was able to participate in the conversation today. Um, I want to say a big thanks to uh, to Bert and to Mark and to Bob and to Elizabeth um, for spending your time on this discussion. I think I'm going to be uh, closing it out and saying thank you to everybody who joined, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to distribute uh, distribute the contents to those who were not able to join. But thank you very much for uh, for spending your time and and sharing your insights with us on this really important topic. And and good luck as you as you continue to pursue your work in this area. Well, thank you. And thank you, Sarah, for your moderation. This was quite nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.